Thank you very much for having me. Anin Nindaway Maganinduk, Nigagwe Gitimagas, Bine Sikwe to go, Makwendo Dam, Gawa Babani Kagish, Kanaganing, and Dunjabami Gwich. That's uh, our language, which I guess you might have gathered. I'm uh, telling you where I'm from, which is the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. It's one of 19 Anishinaabe reservations in the United States. There's about 150 of them in Canada northern part of five American states, southern part of four Canadian provinces, second largest native community in North America after the Navajo Nation. Just a little context, I know you're not from here. But. And um, thank you again. There's a, in, in my community, there is a uh, man named Mike Wiggins who a couple of weeks ago was testifying at the Wisconsin legislature against a big mine, a taconite mine, uh, coming into his territory. And it is testimony, he said, um, seems like we don't want to hang around another thousand years or more. Really interesting construct. The idea of a society which appears to be looking kind of short term versus a society that's been there for maybe five or six thousand years. Seems like we don't want to hang around another thousand years. And I reflect a lot upon that and I'm going to ask you to kind of go into my territory. Um, these are just a bunch of pictures from my community and a couple other communities I work with um, that I thought I'd show you. Um, but this moon, this month in my time, uh, in my community is called Iskigami Gizigizis, which means the maple syruping moon. Yeah? We are followed with a Wabagana Gizis, the flower moon, Odaemon Gizis, the strawberry moon, Mean Gizis, which is the blueberry moon, Manomenake Gizis, the wild rice making moon, Watibaga Gizis, when the leaves change color, Gashkad no Gizis, when it freezes over. Uh, Manadu Gizis soons, little spirit moon. Giji Manadu Gizis, great spirit moon. Namei Bene Gizis, the sucker moon. It's a kind of a fish that moves under the ice in the winter that we fish through the ice. And then Anabana Gizis, which is also known as the hard crusted snow moon. Or basically, when it snows and then it thaws and it freezes again. Does that make sense? I have no idea if you have that in Australia anywhere, no. <laughs> but just imagine with me for a minute, okay? <laughs> also known as the moon that you do not want to do a face plant in the snow. So I, I don't know if you know why I told you that. I thought you might like to hear my language um, because I'm someone that believes, like apparently most of you do, that cultural diversity is as important as biological diversity. That is how we relate to the world and that is the beauty of our humanity. And it is very, very important to keep because I'm pretty sure that the people who do their ceremonies and sing their songs in the way that they have for thousands of years are probably the ones that are gonna keep us going more than any technological fix at any point in time. What I also know, and I think you might have figured out, is that did you notice that none of those moons is named after a Roman emperor? Really, really important construct. The idea that it is possible to have an entire worldview that has nothing to do with empire. It's okay, you can let it go. Just let it go. Just take a breath, it's gone, you know. I think about that a lot because even as we have these discussions on where we are going, we are quite often grappling with empire and where we are. And the reality is, is that you have to spend a good chunk of time fighting empire in order to live. That is the reality of the situation we're in. But at the same time, we need to be really careful, I think, to not take all the trappings of empire with us to where we are going. And that is a little bit of our philosophy in our, in our work in my community. You know, I'm very privileged. I live in the same community that my great, 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 greats lived. I race the same lakes. I farm on the same land. I uh, have the same ceremonies. We're not Christians. Um, we're good. You know, we're good, but I got to fight like heck to keep it. You know, that is the reality because the jackhammer of industrial civilization is really loud, is really pervasive, and is really daunting. You know, so I always think about that when I come to a place like Byron Bay. I've, I've been to these beautiful places, and it's like a bubble. You know, I'm quite aware of that. Uh, but it is raging outside of here. It is good to have sanctuaries, but do not become an island of political correctness unto yourself. Don't do it because it's not the way it is in the world. So in my community, we have a phrase which I think is pretty much the economics of happiness phrase, I'm not sure. Uh, Minobamata Ziwan, Minobamata Ziwan, which is what one 
wishes to attain the good life, the good life, probably in Buddhist teachings, Hindu teachings, and pretty much every set of teaching at some level has nothing to do with material accumulation, has nothing to do with stature and status. In fact, generosity is far more valued than, than hoarding. <laughs> we'll go with that. It has nothing to do with a lot of the things that we are taught in this American or in, in an industrial education that is of value. In fact, when I asked one of my elders what the word for an economy was, which is a funny question to have with a first language speaker who lives in the bush, what is an economy? And he's like, this is our, our grandpa guy, he says, uh, how we live. That's what he said, how we live. And then he distinguished the white man economy very clearly as two different things. And so I think a lot about that because we have to be clear on, on what it is we are doing and, and where it is we are going and also very much where we are. So when I think about the work that I do in my community, and it is not so much the economics of happiness, but maybe something that is like indigenous restorative economics. How, you, how we, as the people who are here now, who have this privilege of being the ones who have a shot at doing great things, the ones that have a shot at keeping them from blowing off the top of a mountain or genetically engineering everything in the world, right? Or combusting us into oblivion with climate change and fossil fuels. They have the shot of doing something great, the spiritual opportunity. That part of what we are doing is restoring our relationship, the depth of our relationship, the spiritual and the way we live relationship with our earth, our mother earth, because we all only have one mother in the end. Don't have another planet to go to, do we? It's pretty much it, pretty much it. So I thought about what to talk about, and um, you know, I'm showing you pictures of some of the things we do. I will do a bit more of, I'll talk a little bit about that, but let me say that I think that there are some precepts in indigenous economic thinking that are important foundations. I think that those precepts are shared, but sometimes they're, uh, I don't know how we say them. But what we say in our community is that there are basically five really important elements, I think. The first is that the creator's law is the highest law, higher than the laws made by nation states or municipalities. And one would do well to live in accordance with the creator's law. The second is the teaching of Indinawe Maganaduk, which means we are all related. Whether we have wings or fins or roots or paws or hands, we are all, all related. And we as humans are pretty much the last ones to arrive. The rest of those guys can live pretty well without us, but we are entirely dependent on them. But some of them do need us, like corn in itself could not have been created with, without the love in the hands of humans. But many things live without us quite well. A third basic precept that I think is very important is that of cyclical, a cyclical worldview. In an indigenous or a land-based economy, which could be on any continent, but is certainly not generally in a settler economy, the reality is, is that the natural world is cyclical the tides, the moons, the seasons. Our lives themselves in many ways are cyclical. And in that, that is how one needs to figure out how to have an economy that reflects that. A fourth precept, which I think that all those who are here would agree, is the idea that in, in our language, for instance, Anishinaabe Moan, in our language, most nouns are animate. Even the word asin, asin, the word for stone, is an animate noun. So what does that do to your worldview? If the world is made up of animate things, they are alive, they have standing, they have spirit unto themselves. That is entirely different, of course, than what happens in the English language where we change things and turn them into natural resources and agricultural products, for instance as opposed to live spiritual beings, yeah. And then there is the idea of, of in each deliberation, 
considering the impact upon the seventh generation from now. That set of teachings we find to be absolutely essential in where we are going, and it, is, uh, it makes us responsible to those who have not yet arrived. So generally, these are some pictures from my community. I um, work in my community, and a lot of our work is on restoring the economy that has been around for a thousand years, because we think it's actually worth something. We think our wild rice is beautiful, twice the protein and half the calories of market varieties, and it grows on a lake. And if you take care of your lake, you got rice. We think that our greatest assets are our culture, the beauty of our people, and the fact that we have class four wind power, which is a lot better than most of the rest of the country. And we are interested in being the people that are going to be around for a thousand years or more. So the story I told you about the precepts is pretty much in direct conflict with this American society and this Australian society. We have policymakers that believe that man's laws can regulate things and trade carbon. We are very individualized, self-centered, absorbed. We have a linear economy and the vernacular that goes with it and is marketed. For instance, the idea of a nuclear fuel cycle actually doesn't exist because it turns out uranium and plutonium are not the same thing. Duh. The idea that everything can be commodified and price tag, put a price tag on it, and the idea that we are only responsible for this quarter's profits. That's how they think. And that's what we absolutely must move past. So, as I think of where we are to go together, because we are all in this together, you know, I was very happy to see the indigenous people who came and greeted us last night and welcomed us to country. And I'm fully aware of my position and our positions in our society. You know, where I come from and the communities that I work with, we are in a tough spot because we have this beauty. We may be, you know, 2,000 indigenous communities in North America, which are probably the best shot at knowing what it is to not have a piece of the pie and knowing we absolutely want our own pie. We are people who actually know how to live here on this land, because we've done it for a really, really, really long time, but yet we are on full-on assault by multinational corporations and by the legal institutions of Canada, Australia, the United States, which basically put guns to our heads to tell us to sign agreements. It is really, really important that people recognize the essential nature of working in solidarity with indigenous peoples as we make changes. You know, I cannot do the work of changing Australia or America. It is way too damn much work for me. You guys got to carry your own bags around and clean them up, frankly. You know? But I know that it is only through a partnership that we're able to live. Because my society's ability to keep doing what it is doing is also very much contingent upon cutting carbon, for instance, right? Cutting the, the inefficient materials economy and restoring a paradigm or remembering a paradigm that's one that makes it so we can all live. So we can all live. In my uh, wanderings, you know, I have a great amount of privilege, including the privilege of being here with you. I laughed one time because um, this friend of mine, he talked about the term colonization, which I heard discussed many times here. I don't know if, uh, so did anybody ever look at the word colonization and inside the word, there's an organ, the colon, right? Turns out they have absolutely the same root. Colonization is probably the, the, you know, material, military, economic, education, religious consumption of one country or people by another paradigm. And we've all been colonized to some level. We're all drinking some kind of Kool-Aid, right? 
So it is really important to, to begin that process of decolonization. To begin that process of decolonization. And in that process, there's our rising. That's my lakes. That's my cousins. <laughs> in that process, we get this chance at being the great people who help figure out how we're going to live for another thousand years. I thank you for your time. I'm good.